Hey everybody, I uh, was actually wondering how long it was ago that I showed you my, my mastering process and my mastering chain because things have changed over time uh, because I bought new gear, because some gear has gone. So today I want to show you, well basically all the equipment I use, why I use certain equipment, the way I use the equipment and also my my basic whole workflow and all the things that I think are important when it comes to mastering. So yeah, let's get started. All right, so the way I wanna do this video is by simply following the signal path. And for this video, I've inserted every single thing that I could be using. It almost never happens that I use all the equipment in the chain. It's really about choosing. So let's first take a look at, at how my, my mastering session looks like. This is basically it. It's a very simple session. I, I like simplicity. So it basically starts with an example which always holds the original file. So I can quickly check and listen to the original mix from my client. And uh, this really gives a good perspective or a good, like, like you understand what you're doing when checking this. When I receive reference tracks, I always try to import them uh, in here as well and have also a few other channels. I like to keep this small, so like, original mix from the from the client one or two reference tracks and that's it i'm not doing like seven reference tracks or whatever because that will only well basically lead to confusion instead of actually helping me now the next channel is where the magic starts and it's basically a, a duplication of it it's my pre and uh, this is basically my send how it works is that i basically send everything through analog and then have a digital effect chain to basically top of the master. So from here, I'm routing it to my console uh, on channel 11 and 12. What I use this channel for as well is for when repairs need to happen. So I can use the, the insert chain here to insert, well, most of all a pro Q or the split EQ from Eventide uh, in order to do repairs. Uh, the Split EQ is a really cool EQ for uh, doing repairs and of course Pro Q uh, because it's super versatile. I can, do, I can do a lot of things here, but this is only if it needs repairs. Uh, the other option is uh, sending the client uh, my notes and trying to explain what is going on. This is always very difficult because how do you explain things? But if it's possible, I of course request a new pre-master instead of trying to fix things myself. Now, as said, from this channel, I'm going uh, analog. And when I'm going analog, it's all starting at my left side, at the channel side of the console. So I'm basically going to these two channels and I'm using these two EQs. The uh, reason why I'm using these is because they are stepped. They are super versatile as well. Uh, I've got like Q factor selection, uh, a lot of frequencies I can use, and they sound very tight. Now I could of course also choose to use these, uh, but that rarely happens. I basically prefer to use these. These are by the way, ANT W696B EQs. Uh, I actually had to modify the console to fit them uh, in there. <laughs> From there, they're going to subgroup one and two and on the insertion point of the subgroup, I've got all my analog gear. The reason for that is that it uh, gives me easy access to my gaining. So I can gain over here, also left and right channel, and I can gain over here on the return back to Reaper. And again, I can do the left right balancing here as well. Now the first thing that I would normally put in the chain, if I wanna use it, is my uh, tape machine, this thing. And that's a Sony MCI JH24 uh, tape machine. It is a 24 channel tape machine and quite honestly, it's not really suited for mastering. Uh, it has a very nice color to it, so sometimes it works, but most of the times I'm actually not using the tape machine uh, on my master bus. And the main reason why I don't really use it on mastering is because um, the capstan motor, so the motor that pulls the tape through the machine, isn't really stable. It, it's very stable, of course. It is not as stable as the tape machine I've used before, which was the Telefunken M15. And the Telefunken was actually so stable that I could do parallel tape processing. So I could have a, a non-tape version and a tape version and then layer them together and, and blend them together, which really works well when using tape on a master bus. However, 
uh, with the JH24, it's just you either use the tape or not. You cannot blend it or whatever. So it really depends on the track and on the song if, if I want to use it. I do still have my M15 tape machine, by the way, but it's it really needs a lot of repairs. It actually needs new tape heads, which I don't have. And um, I actually also don't really have the room anymore in here to, to put it. It's, it's quite a big machine. And quite honestly, I'm very happy with the results that I'm getting right now with everything else that I have in my chain. So let's quickly listen to to the tape machine. I will never cry for you, cry for you, cry for you, cry for you. So this is with tape. I can take this anymore. You say we're done. And this is my scent, so this is really cool. I can I can really level it here. Give a little bit more. Too much. And normally I would have two hands, but now I'm holding the camera so I could also adjust the return gain. Now for centering my, my analog chain, I actually have a little bit of a trick. I can press pink noise here, which puts pink noise on my, um, on my output. And then I can see over here what is going on. Actually, what I can also see is that the machine needs a little bit of cal uh, calibration on the top and the bottom end, but quite honestly, it's still within spec. Now I can do delete FX to cut the uh, pink noise again. All right, so the next thing that would be in my chain after the tape machine, it's always optional, is the, the Dictator, which is a, a Pentoed Very Mu compressor. I like to use this compressor first because it's very calm, it's very subtle. Let me just quickly show you what, what this thing is capable of. So we've got of course low and high comp. We're doing low. Low is the most fair child like. Just a bit. Less than this. Bit of a slow attack. What it can do really cool is uh, have a sidechain filter. So I can cut out all the low frequencies. So it doesn't respond to the low frequencies. Now I can give a little bit more. I really like what it does with with the sound and the coloration. One thing to notice is that I actually use it on the unlinked mode. Weirdly enough, the stereo field sounds better when it's unlinked. However, on some songs where there is really some stereo stuff happening, like like a certain dominant thing on the left and the right, you have to link it, of course. But but when it's possible, I, I actually unlink it, which, well, it works. That's why I'm doing it. Next up in the chain would be one of these two. It would either be the cream, cram, cream, whatever, from Tegler, or my um, self-built SSL. Uh, style compressor. Right now I only have this one in there because it's the most versatile and the best one to talk about. The SSL usually works very good on uh, electronic style productions, productions that need a little bit more aggressive compression and quicker compression as well. Like the, the timing of the SSL is, is way quicker than from the Cream. So the cool thing about the Cream is that it isn't only just a uh, compressor, uh, it also has a very simple EQ in here. So we've got low and high. It's a very subtle EQ as well. Let's quickly show you what this thing is capable of as well. So this is already, I mean, a lot more aggressive than this with thing. I like to use long attack times on my compressors. And again, analog just using a bit. Now this one also has a sidechain filter, so it's really cool. So I can really not have it respond to the low frequencies. So we can do very subtle EQing. Like I'm putting it on 10 and listen at how subtle it is. It's there, it's very usable. 
It's also only boosting. It's really first on handy to use. Goes to 24 kilohertz. Which of course, 24 we can't hear, but the bell leading up to 24 we can. And also because it's analog, it doesn't have any like cramping or oversampling or whatever that's needed. It just, it just works. That's really cool. Now from this analog chain, uh, I'm going back digitally again. And how I basically do that is by, by recording the result. Now, I'm recording the audio in Reaper for multiple reasons. One of them is of course easy recall, so that if I only need to change the digital part of my mastering chain, I don't have to reset all the analog stuff. But of course it can happen that I also need to recall the analog stuff. And how I'm doing that is by basically taking pictures. I'm doing that with my phone or with my iPad. I'm taking pictures of everything that I've used. I'm actually drawing on those pictures as well to, to describe like where it is in the chain, what the important things are and, and that kind of stuff. And then I'm putting it together with the project in my project management system. Uh, I'm using Notion for that and I'm actually working on a video uh, describing how that actually uh, works and comes together and, and that kind of stuff. It's really important to make those pictures because usually when a client listens back to their first master, uh, they can get inspired to change something in the mix or whatever and they sent me a new mix a new pre-master and for my services it's not really a problem if you send a new pre-master or whatever unless you're doing it like a lot of times but i need to be able to to run it to the same chain again so that's why the recalls are really important on the, on the mastering side of the business now while we're waiting for um this thing to uh, complete its recording uh, i'm usually drinking coffee or whatever uh, it also gives a good moment to listen to the full track just listening not not adjusting settings, but just listening. What usually happens is that I'm recording this a few times because I'm I'm hearing something else or I, I still want to change something. This is something that, is, that you are forced to do in analog mastering, which I think it's actually a good thing. All right, so it's finished. From here, I'm using my digital mastering chain to, to finish it off. This is the chain. <laughs> and again, I'm not always using all of these plugins. So I'm starting with a Pro-Q3, and basically why I'm doing this is, um, um, is to, whenever it's necessary, to cut uh, the low frequencies. I try to do a 72 or 96 dB cut. I never use the brick wall filter because it sometimes can lead to a little bit of ringing. Now what I can also do here is cut the low frequencies on the sides. Uh, this is actually something I always learned to do in school, but with modern day audio systems, it's, it's not really necessary anymore. Uh, if you're delivering to vinyl, uh, you actually have to cut the side signal uh, by a lot. But mastering for vinyl is something else. Next up in the chain, uh, the one that I really like to use is the Elusia Alpha compressor. And I I've been talking openly about this. This is one of those compressors that I really w would like to have uh, analog. Um, but yeah, the Alpha compressor, what it does really well is the mid-side processing. So I can do separate compression on my side channel. <laughs> Quite honestly, there's not a lot of very interesting information in the side channels in this track. But it's really cool that I can really grab my center image and really, really package it together the way I want and have my sides breathe a little bit more and uh, uh, maybe now I'm killing the transients, maybe letting, letting the transients through that kind of. So that's really cool about the Alpha Compressor. Alpha Compressor is always optional in my master uh, chain. Uh, I don't always need to use it. And quite honestly, on this track, I wouldn't use it. Next up is the Pro MB. And the reason why I really like to use a pretty advanced multiband compressor is because uh, I can change the timing on the individual bands. That's the reason why I like to use a, a multiband compressor. It's not necessarily for other reasons. It's really about timing. Uh, one of the things I really like to do is to, to really compress the low frequencies, uh, get them under control. 
and as you can see over here, I really like to, to be aggressive on the low frequencies over here. And mainly also because in all the other parts of my uh, compression, I'm not really doing anything with the low frequencies. Now, depending on the production, if it's more electronic, uh, this band is really important. It's that mid-low uh, frequency band that really gives the push in the production. It's, it's really important in, in electronic music. In acoustic music, again, depending on the production, uh, it's sometimes not needed and then I'm, I'm deleting it and just using one low band over here. But what I really like to do on that band is, is have a long attack time so that that push is really still coming through. Then of course the mid band, which is uh, basically, I'm calling this is the band that everybody hears. So that's uh, like the iPhone band or the car band or whatever. So this is really a really important band and something that I really want to have under control separately. Uh, usually have a pretty quick attack and release uh, on there, uh, but not a lot of compression. Uh, on the high frequencies, I actually like to use a longer attack time so that the transients can come through a little bit uh, again. And I actually, uh, again, depending on the production, uh, uh, I decide the amount of compression that is needed. If it's like a very aggressive production, the higher frequencies, I like to use a little bit more compression over there to really, well, not cutting it out, but really having those frequencies stay there. <laughs> like not not really getting it to you. And that is basically it. I tend to work a lot uh, on, on the multiband settings actually. I, I actually spent a fair amount of time uh, using it. Next up, might be a little bit of a surprise, is the Saturn II. And why I use the Saturn II compared to analog distortion or the tape machine is because on Saturn II I can do multiband distortion. And what I usually like to do, and this is also on electronic productions where things have to have way more energy, way more, way more, like way more, it has to be way more flattened or something. I, I don't really know how to describe the sound that I mean. On electronics productions, you, you usually uh, want to have some, some saturation. Um, it, it does compress a lot as well by doing this. So I really like to use it on my, well, everything above 200, 300, what, whatever works for production. I mean, listen to... Listen to, to the amount of energy that it's that is adding. Like, like it does something, it really creates a little bit of a wall of sound uh, using that. And of course I can go even further by using heavy saturation or a different preset. I can use mixing, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, on this production, I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't use it. And then of course to end it all, to, uh, to, to limit it, the last stage in my mastering chain uh, is the, the Pro L uh, to make it louder because that's what the L stands for which stands for limiter, whatever. Cool thing about this thing is that I can uh, immediately see my, my lifts amount. Uh, when I'm delivering for streaming, I'm keeping the lifts amount lower, of course. I've made a lot of videos about it and there's a lot of information about it already. So I'm not going to go into depth about that right now, but this is this is basically my last, last part of my mastering chain. Usually lowering the output level as well a little bit. And what I really like to do on the Pro-L is uh, using the one-on-one -on -one setting, which uh, basically, uh, it, it does the limiting stuff, uh, but it doesn't make it louder. And this is really cool for monitoring. So when I go back to my mix, for comparison, I don't have the huge level uh, difference. Uh, and I usually actually need to dial down and the mix a little bit in order to monitor at the same level. What is really cool about Fab Filter in general is that it has all the features that you need, like oversampling, different uh, limiting styles, that kind of stuff. Again, the amount of limiting that I, I want to use really depends on the production again, uh, and also on, on like where it needs to be delivered. Uh, again, on electronic music, they want more uh, heavy mastering, um, uh, heavy limiting, louder productions. I, I'm trying to talk them out of it, but 
doesn't happen. And uh, uh, when it's more pop production, more some for streaming, there's actually usually some room for dynamics, dynamic range and that kind of stuff. And that's what I always try to use. But again, it's, it's really production dependent, really goal dependent. Like where's the production going to? Is it streaming or is it for something else? Is it for a movie or is it for a trailer? What, whatever, what, what are we doing? The story is always really important to understand in order to make the right choices here. Now you would say that this is the end of the master chain and this is uh, partly true but what I think is a very important part of any mastering chain is the monitoring system as well uh, and as you all know I, I have the Quasar setup from Lennart which I make, made a video about over here and will soon make another video about uh, explaining a bit more about the monitoring system but I actually think that a very important reason to choose uh, a certain mastering studio or certain mastering engineer is because of their monitoring system and also the synergy between the monitoring system and the engineer like the engineer really knows the system and uh, really knows the equipment and you know, is having a lot of uh, experience. And I think this is one of the things that is often forgotten when we are talking about uh, mastering, equipment mastering, gear, and that kind of stuff. It's really the monitoring system and the acoustics uh, that make the difference because you want to be able to hear everything without smearing and that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying that things are impossible on less accurate uh, monitoring solutions. However, things will be more difficult. And uh, how will you be sure if your monitoring system is masking? Like, like those are the, the questions that, that you should really ask yourself uh, when you are mastering for yourself. Like, like how are you going to... To check translation and that kind of stuff, and, and I'm again, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but I'm just saying that it's a little bit more of a of a hassle. And and I actually think that there's a lot of value in in using an external uh, engineer to master uh, your productions. Actually, in a few months, I'm going to redo an old video of mine where I'm going to compare uh, a real mastering engineer, which isn't going to be me, but I'm not revealing who it is uh, yet. I'm going to compare a real mastering engineer uh, with. Um, instant mastering like services that you have uh, on the internet where you can have a, a master made for like five dollars and it's instantly delivered uh, that kind of stuff um, there have been a lot of developments on that field so that's why i'm going to redo that video and i also want to show you all the value of a mastering engineer compared with um, doing it yourself or having a computer uh, do it so yeah, that's all that I wanted to share today about, uh, well, my mastering chain and my mastering method. Uh, again, this wasn't meant as a tutorial uh, and the sound that I was making, I was actually not really listening. I'm more working on presenting everything in the correct way. So uh, don't use any of the settings or whatever that I've uh, showed, but uh, use the philosophy. Or of course, use your own philosophy because there are multiple ways to do it. Now, all the gear and plugins that I've showed, I'm not in contact with them. They don't know about me making this, whatever. It's completely independent, but that's, I think, pretty obvious uh, from this video. Now, if you like that independence, then make sure to support me. And the coolest way to support me is by, uh, well, it's by booking a session, actually. That is actually the biggest source of support for the YouTube channel because YC Studio is actually financing uh, this whole thing. So you can book a session on ycstudio.com, uh, but you can also buy gear uh, using my affiliate links. And I'm going to make a QR code. So one for Toman over here and one for Sweetwater over here. And by scanning that QR code, you will actually be forwarded to the store and if you buy something in the store after using the QR code or the link in the description when you buy something then a little bit gets kicked back to me so it's really cool you're not paying anything extra it's just they are rewarding me for sending customers their way another way to support me is by pledging a bit to my patreon campaign which i'm going to link over here patreon is really a donation campaign uh, check it out all the details are on patreon a last way to support me and the whole youtube platform is by watching more videos so i'll link one of my videos over here but youtube will do its best to recommend other people's videos around this one. I want to thank you all for watching. Keep pushing. And bye bye.